Uh, good morning and welcome to uh, CSIS. Uh, we're thrilled today uh, to be able to welcome um, uh, Ambassador Niels Dolaire, Ambassador Leslie Rowe, Todd Summers as our, as our speakers here today on the whole question of the future of diplomacy 2013 and looking beyond. And um, we're, we're thrilled that Catherine Bliss, a senior advisor here, is, is able to join us to, to uh, run this session today. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we were uh, very, very busy in the latter part of 2012 putting together an analysis of across multiple sectors of what had transpired in the first Obama term in global health policy, and that resulted in the volume that many of you have contributed to and I hope have benefited from, which is global health policy in the second Obama term. Uh, in the course of that work, we uh, put an enormous amount of, of emphasis upon diplomacy. There's an entire chapter. Catherine uh, was the lead author of a chapter on international diplomacy. We put an enormous amount of emphasis upon the partnerships with multilateral institutions. Uh, Todd Summers uh, uh, was uh, the author of, uh, of, of the Global Fund chapter and contributed significantly to many of the other uh, multilateral um, pieces. We put a very high focus upon the indispensable value of high-level U.S. leadership across the entire spectrum uh, of, of efforts. Uh, and you'll see that reflected across the different chapters. Um, we put uh, great emphasis upon bipartisanship uh, as fundamental to the successes of the last decade uh, in terms of Congress, but the broad consensus within American society that gave it, that empowered and made it possible uh, for this administration and the prior administrations to, to do some remarkable things um, in global health. As we put this volume together, we called upon many of our friends in the administration to help us, and Niels was particularly generous uh, in sharing his time with us over extended conversations in several different settings, and many of the other key senior officials within the administration also shared with us their views over the course of that, and we're very grateful. And I think the quality of the product, uh, the level of detail and, and nuance within it is reflective of their, of their input. I'm very grateful to many people on CSIS staff who helped us pull today's event together. Carolyn Schrote, Matt Fisher, Alicia Kramer, Jacob Eckless, and Rachel Wood, among others who are here. I'm also very grateful to the many authors of the chapters in this, many of whom are here with us. I've already mentioned Catherine and Todd, but we're also joined. Becky Katz is here, uh, Nellie Bristol, Janet Fleischman, and I'm probably missing, I haven't identified several of our other authors. Uh, at the end of the day, we, we drew upon over a dozen different expert authors uh, to bring this volume um, together, and we're very grateful to them. So thank you all for being with us. Uh, this is very important for us, for the reasons I've laid out, to be able to carry forward this discussion around diplomacy, the diplomatic agenda, uh, what lies ahead, as Catherine will explain, 2013, there's a burst of opportunities and challenges on the horizon uh, diplomatically, and we'll be talking about those today. We're also joined online uh, by a few hundred people who've kindly agreed to, to join us through that, and welcome to you as well. So with that, thank you so much, and please join me in welcoming uh, our esteemed panel here today. Well, good morning, and let me reiterate uh, the welcome that, that Steve has already offered. I hope you can hear me. Is this, it's not on? Okay. All right, let me get it a little closer. Does that work? All right. Oh, I'm going to have to keep it right here. Okay. Um, boy. <laughs> While I figure out my technical issues, let me just hold it here. Uh, 2013 is shaping up to be an extremely active year on the global health agenda, uh, particularly with respect to multilateral engagement. Uh, on the one hand, there are a number of uh, replenishment processes that will be getting underway. Uh, the global fund replenishment, uh, which is looking to shape up over the course of the fall, uh, the replenishment for the Gavi 
Alliance, uh, the World Bank, IDA. At the same time, you have the regular set of meetings that engage a variety of countries on global health, uh, the World Health Assembly, uh, the G20, the G8 meetings, all of which will be coming up. And finally, there are some special uh, meetings and discussions as well, not only the uh, discussions around the high-level panel regarding the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals, but also the UN General Assembly Resolution on Universal Health Care. So there's a lot to be discussed, there's a lot at stake for global health, and there are a number of opportunities for the United States to contribute to the engagement of countries and the support of countries for those processes. We are very fortunate today to be joined by three experts, three people who have really been working these issues on the ground, who are here to share their perspectives with us. We have two from the United States government, and one from CSIS who has been very much involved in some of the recent discussions around funding and reform at the Global Fund and who can share their perspectives. I want to first introduce to my left Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs at the Office of Global Affairs at the Department of Health and Human Services, Dr. Nils Dallaire. Uh, Nils Dallaire is the, um, also the U.S. Representative to the World Health Organization's Executive Board and previously served as the CEO and President of the Global Health Council here in Washington, D.C. Also to my left is Ambassador Leslie Rowe, who is in charge of day-to-day -day operations at the new Office of Global Health Diplomacy at the Department of State. And in that capacity, she's very much responsible for helping to link the operations on global health at the department, at the headquarters level, with what happens at the embassy level and in the field, and making sure that ambassadors and the officers who work with them in a variety of capacities are able to fulfill the U.S. government's work on global health diplomacy at that diplomatic level. To my far left is Todd Summers, who is currently senior advisor uh, with the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS in Washington. Todd has also been instrumental as the chair of the Global Health Board, the Global Funds Board on Strategy Investments and it's the, uh, the SIC and Impact Committee. I remembered the SIC part of it. <laughs> and so Todd has been instrumental in working through the past couple of years of the reform process to uh, work with countries and, and with the board to envision a, a, new, um, a new vision for, um, for investments. So we're very fortunate to have these three here with us today. <coughs> this is intended to be a conversation. Uh, so I will first turn to the panelists with a, a series of questions to elicit some conversation and debate and discussion among them, and then we will turn to you in the audience to invite um, comment, but you know, really to engage in the conversation as well. Uh, that's, that's the goal here, is to really identify the key priorities uh, for the U.S. And, and in the context of the multilateral process, and to, and to have a conversation about how some of the, the priorities and, and approaches will play out. So we will turn to you, the audience, um, after about 45 minutes to an hour or so. And uh, I will invite you to uh, wait for a microphone, which will be passed around. And because we have our online uh, uh, audience as well, to speak into the microphone and identify yourself and, and your affiliation so that the conversation can, can continue. So let me start uh, by turning to Assistant Secretary Dallaire uh, at Health and Human Services to ask you to set the stage for us for this conversation. What what are the, the major issues on the global health agenda, uh, particularly with respect to multilateral engagement this year? What are the U.S. priorities within that context? And you know, can you give us a sense of you know, what these mean for, for global health and why it's important that U.S. leadership really play a strong role? Thank you. First, is the microphone working since we already found one that was it, Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, let me just start with uh, a, a brief overview of global health diplomacy, and uh, Ambassador Rowe, uh, I'm sure, will, uh, will talk about this as well. Um, we reflect sort of different, uh, different angles on the issue of global health diplomacy, but I go back to uh, Will Rogers' famous quote, uh, diplomacy is the art of saying nice doggy until you can find a rock. And that's <laughs> very different. I like doggy. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's a very different concept from the concept that we use in global health diplomacy. In fact, uh, global health diplomacy is the art of finding a good hamburger to share with the doggy uh, so that you can work together on tracking something else down. And we're seeing that um, right now in uh, China. Uh, 
when Secretary Sebelius and I traveled there for the uh, U.S.-China high-level meeting in uh, the end of uh, May of uh, 2010, uh, we were there with Secretary Clinton and Secretary Geithner, uh, and each, each of the departments, cabinet departments, had a separate set of uh, conversations with their counterparts in the Chinese government. Uh, and as you all know, uh, we continue to have issues of currency valuation and trade. Uh, we continue to have differences in terms of geopolitical issues. Uh, but at the end of that meeting and the subsequent meetings that have taken place, uh, one thing that was highlighted was just how well the United States and China were working together in the health arena. Now, this has real payoff. We're seeing it this week with the emergence of uh, H7H, sorry, H7N9 uh, influenza virus, uh, in which the Chinese have been very proactive because of the long-term engagement with the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and others to help them build their surveillance system uh, in our multilateral engagement with the Chinese in developing uh, means to address global pandemic. This is an area in which uh, global health diplomacy is working directly to protect both the Chinese people and the American people and, and the world. Obviously, there's a lot to be discovered still about this, uh, uh, this virus, but it's been remarkable how quickly things have gone, and that is a tribute to global health diplomacy. So uh, this is a good time uh, for global health, a growing, growing recognition of global interconnectedness, uh, but at the same time, we recognize with the fiscal realities, not only here in Washington, uh, but around the world, that we have to do things better, smarter, to the extent possible, cheaper. And this is where uh, the agenda uh, for the, not only this year, but for the coming years comes in. Uh, you asked what the key issues were coming up, and uh, I could probably do this for 40 or 50 minutes, I won't. Uh, but uh, let me raise some of the, the uh, issues that are at the very top of the agenda for both bilateral and multilateral discussions. Uh, you mentioned the UN General Assembly uh, Universal Health Care uh, Resolution. The United States was deeply involved in those negotiations through the State Department, but with a lot of input from my department in terms of the recognition, whereas in past discussions at the UN, uh, the U.S. was quite reluctant to sign on uh, to something that seemed to confer a new universal right. Well, in fact, um, universal health care is the underlying premise of the Affordable Care Act. So this is an area in which uh, the Department of Health and Human Services had a strong interest in being a, an active and positive part of the global uh, discussions about this, and that helped to move the resolution forward. <coughs> and continues now with, uh, you know, how do we actually do this? How do we work together? Uh, and there are a whole set of follow-on activities at WHO and other places. Uh, the Global Fund. Uh, I sit as the, um, uh, the alternate U.S. board member on the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, and the Global Fund, having gone through some substantial changes over the past uh, year and a half, two years, um, that uh, I think Todd will be talking more about, uh, is now facing uh, the next replenishment, looking to find the resources to carry out its important mission, uh, and that's a very important part of our agenda moving forward. In terms of some key health issues that are very high on our radar screen, both at WHO and, uh, as I said, also bilaterally, pandemic preparedness and global health security is extremely high uh, on our agenda, uh, obviously underlined by what's going on in China today. Uh, but we also recognize that the issues of uh, pandemic preparedness and the potential for uh, catastrophic natural events, uh, leaving aside the, the possibility of human-caused events, is one that we need to build uh, robust systems that really cover the entire globe. Uh, and that includes uh, the international health regulations, which is an obscure thing for many people, but it's actually the reporting system around the world for uh, for unexpected events that will help us to get early warning in place. Uh, polio continues to be uh, a very important issue for us as, as well as for others with only three remaining endemic countries. Uh, Non-communicable diseases has emerged on the global stage as an area in which all countries have uh, strong interests and in, in which we need to work together on a policy front 
uh, to find common ways to combat some of the leading contributors to these uh, uh, devastating and extraordinarily expensive illnesses. Um, in addition, we now have a growing set of concerns around uh, drugs uh, circulating in the global market that are uh, substandard, spurious. There's a long term for it. I won't go through that. Uh, but uh, bad drugs, basically, uh, that are sold as if they're good ones, which are both uh, killers in some instances, and in some instances, because they have small amounts of the right kinds of medication in them, uh, lead to uh, resistance to those drugs, uh, such as artemisinin for malaria, which could have devastating consequences. Uh, and uh, finally, last but certainly not least, um, the work going on to define the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals, which will be uh, immensely important in terms of setting the global agenda, and the recognition uh, that these goals are likely not to be just about uh, the poorest countries, not only the health issues there, but given that in a globalizing context, we are now seeing pockets of poverty in middle income and upper middle income and uh, even upper income countries uh, that need to be addressed through common means. Uh, the MDGs are likely to reflect that. So um, what do we do to make this new model of engagement work? Um, there are two sides to this. One is that um, technical expertise, which my department through the Centers for Disease Control, National Institutes of Health, the Food and Drug Administration, uh, Mental Health uh, and Substance Abuse uh, Administration, and others uh, represent some of the highest technical expertise in the world. We're not always terrific at the diplomacy side. Uh, and being right does not make you effective. Uh, and so one of the things that we work on at uh, my office of Global Affairs is bringing diplomatic skills and know-how into the technical dialogue. Uh, but uh, in turning this over to my good friend, uh, Leslie Rowe, uh, the other thing that we need is the diplomatic side of the, um, of the discussion, uh, aware of, conscious of, and committed to the health side. Uh, and uh, we see the work being done by the new Office of Global Health Diplomacy uh, as being a perfect match to the work being done uh, by my Office of uh, Global Affairs at HHS. Uh, so this is a, a budding partnership, but a very positive one. Okay, well, thank you very much. It's clearly a very small agenda with very few, <laughs> few issues. I'm sure we'll be out of here in five minutes or so. Uh, no, let, me, uh, let me turn to Ambassador Rowe. You have recently joined a fairly recently formed office uh, that's still less than a year old, the Office of Global Health Diplomacy. And you are charged with carrying out much of the day-to-day -day operations in, in linking uh, headquarters and Washington area discussions with what happens in the field and um, ensuring uh, the diplomatic um, uh, consistency that, uh, that uh, links uh, the foreign policy and, and health work. And I wanted to ask you to say a little bit about the office. Uh, tell us a bit about its, its mandate and how how the vision is, is developing as the office becomes very active. And if you could also tell us about the work that the office is doing uh, in terms of interagency coordination, how important interagency coordination is in terms of defining and executing the U.S. global health agenda when it comes to the diplomatic approach. Well, thank you, Catherine. And um, thank you, Steve, uh, for the opportunity to be here and talk to this uh, this group today. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with my colleagues, also to be working with Ambassador Goosby in the, the newly formed uh, Office of Global Health Diplomacy. We actually um, opened officially in mid-January. A year ago, I was in Mozambique thinking about many other issues as well as global health. Um, and uh, we're, we're very fortunate um, to have a lot of support for this new office. Um, I must tell you, I, I uh, developed a passion for global health about a decade ago when I was in Kenya uh, at the uh, birth of uh, PEPFAR and continued uh, with my subsequent posts uh, in Papua New Guinea and, and also Mozambique. And uh, we have wonderful interagency teams at POST. Um, I will tell you that sometimes when you're in the wilds of uh, the developing world, 
you really wonder if uh, people in Washington have a clue as to what you're doing in the field. And so coming back to Washington, it's really been gratifying to see the number of people uh, who are representing organizations here today who clearly are interested in, engaged in, and care very deeply about global health. So I thank all of you for that. Um, I mentioned that we have very strong support in the new Office of Global Health Diplomacy, uh, starting with Secretary Kerry, who uh, cares deeply about global health. And of course, we've seen his very strong record as a senator uh, for many years, one of the uh, strong supporters of, of PEPFAR from the very beginning. And um, we see more recently as, uh, as secretary in his very first speech at the University of Virginia, in which he talked about the AIDS-free generation, eradicating polio, uh, reducing maternal mortality, and uh, supporting people to avoid malaria, TB, and, uh, and other diseases. So with that, it's a, it's a great start for our office to have that kind of support from the top. Um, I'm going to be a little more pragmatic in my presentation, because as you mentioned, I'm responsible for the day-to-day -day operations and uh, uh, communicating with my colleagues in the field. Uh, our, our, one of our main uh, three goals uh, in, the, uh, in the Office of Global Health Diplomacy is to support our uh, ambassadors and their teams, the deputy chiefs of mission, and also uh, health teams and other people in the country team to make global health uh, a priority and a part of the daily diplomatic dialogue that ambassadors engage in. Um, I mentioned that I've worked with our very strong interagency health teams over the, over the years. And um, what we want to do is to basically use all the tools in the toolbox to make global health a priority. Ambassadors are already very much engaged in global health. Um, I think it's pretty standard operating procedures. Uh, we have access to many different people uh, at all levels of government and in communities. And so, for instance, if I was going to have a meeting with the president or the prime minister or the ministry of finance, um, ministry of health, I would always ask our country team, I'm going to talk about X with the president, but is there something that we need to get more high level attention on and can I raise that issue? I think this is standard for many uh, ambassadors, and we want to make it uh, even easier for them to do this by creating some tools for them that they can easily pull out of their toolbox when they're going to those kinds of, of meetings. So for instance, we've, uh, in, the, in the couple of months that the office has been in operation, we've been looking very carefully at our training institute and the, the kind of curriculum, how global health issues are uh, incorporated into the curriculum. We're developing uh, modules. Everyone in our new office, and we're bringing staff on gradually, will have public diplomacy as part of their uh, mandate to uh, be able to develop talking points and editorials and uh, speeches for ambassadors in the field. We have people in the field that do this already, but we want to, as I said, make it easier for them to do that. So there will be a lot of focus on those kinds of uh, tools for ambassadors. The other one I would mention to you um, is that our new Global Health Diplomacy website is now up, and you can tune into it uh, at www.state.gov slash s slash ghd for Global Health Diplomacy. And you'll have an opportunity to see a number of in, uh, incidences, instances of uh, our model ambassadors who are out there doing global health uh, with photos on a wide variety of, of global health issues, as well as their teams in USAID, HHS, CDC, DOD, Peace Corps. So, um, and in addition, there are some other helpful resources there, links to a number of government um, uh, uh, websites, but also the Global Burden of Disease website the NIH uh, website, which shows uh, World Report, all of the uh, health research uh, projects that are going on all over the world. So this will be a base not only for, uh, for you all to see what we're doing on a periodic basis, but a useful uh, website for our teams in the field. And I encourage you, one thing that we, we really would like would be your input. 
you all have been engaged in global health for many years, and uh, this is a work in progress, so we really welcome your comments and, uh, and input on how we can strengthen this website, strengthen uh, training for our teams overseas. I mentioned support of uh, ambassadors and their teams. The other two uh, areas that uh, they will be talking about uh, will be country ownership of health systems, health system strengthening, and also sharing responsibility with our partners. So we want to give our ambassadors talking points, information that is useful. We were talking about replenishments uh, earlier that Niels mentioned. Um, and that uh, will be an area that we hope ambassadors will be able to do their part uh, as well in terms of uh, seeking new donors and expanding the support from donors that we have. Again, uh, many of our ambassadors already do this. I mean, I distinctly remember about a year and a half ago when support for the Global Fund was not as rapid as we would have liked from some of our committed donors, talking to one of my European uh, colleagues and encouraging them to talk to their capital about the importance of supporting the Global Fund and uh, the shared responsibility that we all have for, for global health. And just one last point that I'll mention, um, actually two, uh, in terms of country ownership and shared responsibility, uh, we are working with World Bank, we're quite excited about this event in two weeks, uh, to convene ministers of uh, health, but also ministers of finance to talk about sustainability and uh, capacity building uh, sovereign funds, and that will be happening in Washington in a couple of weeks. So that's an example of some of the work that we are doing. The one area that I should have started with uh, is how important interagency collaboration is to our office, and I really start with that premise. Uh, it's wonderful to be on the, uh, on the podium with Niels. Uh, Niels and HHS are a perfect example of the kind of collaboration that we have had since the beginning of the, the office. Um, Niels invited me to join the delegation headed by Secretary <coughs> Sibelius to go to the World Health Assembly. Uh, I've had the opportunity to come over and talk to our HHS health attaches. Very interesting and stimulating uh, conversation. And we were together in a plenary session a few weeks ago down in CDC talking to all of our uh, HIV AIDS uh, HHS staff abroad. Um, one of the things that I found to be most important, frankly, in every job that I've had around the world is to get out and meet people and to seek their input, find out what's on their mind. And that has been a thrust of our office from the beginning. I had wonderful briefings, not only at HHS, but at Peace Corps, USAID, very thorough and uh, exciting ideas about how this Office of Global Health Diplomacy can support all of the partners in global health. So we will be collaborating <coughs> and continuing our communication on an ongoing basis with all of our interagency partners. Thank you very much. So Todd, we, we've heard an outline of some of the, the major preoccupations of the US government this year and, and what uh, some of the key opportunities for engagement uh, bilaterally and multilaterally will be. Leslie has mentioned a bit about the new Office of Global Health Diplomacy and how at a practical and logistical level some of the, the training and the relationship building and outreach uh, will take place. You've been working very much with the Global Fund over the past few years, really working with countries and, and um, hearing input uh, from the process of, of the reform and, and the creation of, of new mechanisms. And I wonder if you could share a bit of your perspective, you know, in terms of how, how you see, you know, the, the broader set of countries identifying some of their priorities around these issues, how some of the decisions take place, and how uh, the U.S. strategies um, either, you know, play into those or, or correspond, you know, in a way that, that builds to, to a larger uh, support and discussion. Thanks, and uh, hello, everybody. Nice to see so many old friends here. Um, as you said, I've been involved with the Global Fund now for about 10 or 12 years. I think Ron McInnes and I went to Brussels when they were first setting it up, actually, with the Global Health Council team. Uh, so I've been involved kind of watching the Global Fund grow up in the space when all this energy around global health has been taking off 
Uh, when I started working on health, it was with President Clinton, and as you recall, we were trying to get our first $10 million uh, for uh, the global AIDS effort. So uh, we've come a long way uh, from there. One of the things that's been interesting to see is how the U.S. Uh, plays with respect not only to uh, some of the countries that are fighting the diseases, but also other donors. So the paper that uh, Steve mentioned, uh, the uh, compendium that Steve mentioned, we covered five uh, multilaterals, the Global Fund, Gavi, the World Bank, UNAIDS, and WHO. And there are certainly others, but those are the five that we sort of picked on. And we outline in the paper some of the challenges that we saw staring those organizations in the face and some of the recommendations. And it was done very much from the perspective of the US government. So we didn't pretend that we were trying to give the world guidance. We were really looking at this from the lens of what can the US government do. But it, it spoke to how the US could play a much more effective role working with other governments that are donors and other governments that are implementers and the civil society groups that are often uh, very involved in, at both levels. So I wanted to focus in sort of two areas. One is around policy and one is around money. Um, policy is really where I think the, the US can and should and has been playing a really important role and, and, and looking at the government level it gets really dicey really fast. Uh, you know, so we're sitting there trying to figure out how to deal with Uganda with a president that wants to not only criminalize male-to-male uh, uh, -male sex, but actually make it uh, a capital crime. Uh, and you'd imagine what it's like for the US government to be a donor in that situation and to face the stresses where you're being asked, oh, well, how can you possibly fund a government like that? Well, if you don't fund the, the, that program, then people die because they don't get the services they need. So we're constantly in this dilemma, if you will, of trying to exert our influence without putting people uh, in the firing line of those debates. And I think that's a really interesting and important uh, discussion. I, I think it's also interesting to see how we could potentially work with other governments sort of multilaterally on some of those. So rather than dealing with one of those governments bilaterally, maybe we could work together with some of the other donors that have some presence and some influence to be urging for changes in the issues that affect marginalized population and girls and, and some of the challenges that obfuscate success uh, in the fight against the three diseases. So I think in these policy efforts, uh, the US can and should play an effort. Uh, there's also policy debates that happen even among donors. And you, you touched earlier on one of the ones, Catherine, around middle income countries. You know, 72 percent of the world's poorest people live in middle income countries. And a lot of our policies still treat poor people as if they only live in low income countries. And that's, that is a global challenge. And it, it comes right up in, in the Global Fund board meetings. It comes up in Gavi board meetings. It ends up with PAHO and WHO. We really have to be smarter as a community of funders and as implementers about how we deal with very changing dynamics across the world and, and what it means to be a middle income country, what it means to get or not get concessionary pricing, what it means to be prioritized or not prioritized for funding uh, in a lot of those spaces. That's just one example of a policy issue where I think the US could work more closely with others uh, in helping inform and debate and discuss uh, those uh, issues. The, the second area I wanted to touch on was, was money. Uh, we just had a discussion this morning around the global funds replenishment and where the U.S. could perhaps really, uh, take a more uh, effective role in getting other donors to the table. We've had fantastic success in getting the U.S. to step as, up as a donor. Some of us are just still marveling uh, at, at how well the global fund does, uh, it, including in the last continuing resolution where we got $1.6 billion. Uh, really a remarkable statement of, of hard work by uh, community advocates and by politicians and by the US government in kind of making the case for the global fund. But outside, two thirds of the money for the global fund comes from other countries, you know, from France and from the European Commission and from the UK and from Australia and Canada. And we have work to do bilaterally with them to try to get them to match our money. But I, we were talking earlier about the opportunity to work trilaterally. I don't know if that's a word. Um, where we actually maybe can push the Can <laughs> Canadians to call the Brits, to call the French. Uh, to, because so much of this really does have to do with kind of the club of donors. Uh, it's lovely to talk about changing the trajectory of the diseases and the opportunity that we have to move the dial. and take advantage of these new vaccines, and, and yet so much of the decisions around the stuff are bald politics. So you know, we, we could be not only using our bilateral influence, and I think we're doing a lot of that right now,
but also maybe pushing some of the other governments who are donors to be exerting their influence. The second area where we need to focus on money is the implementing country governments themselves. Many of them are not doing near enough in terms of financing their own responses. Uh, I wrote a blog post recently around Nigeria. Nigeria leaks $4 billion a year in lost oil revenues. That happens to be more than the Global Fund and Gavi combined, I think, in terms of, uh, of annual output. Uh, I sat in a discussion the other day, it was confidential so I won't talk about it, but uh, Nigeria's malaria phase two uh, grant where 4% of the contribution was coming from the national government and, and from the states, zero. Uh, that just simply is unacceptable. So how do we and maybe some of the other donors and maybe even some of the other implementing governments go to President Jonathan and say, look, we are happy to support your efforts to fight malaria, but they are your efforts and you need to put more skin in the game. So I'm, very interested to see how the U.S. can use its diplomatic muscle and perhaps do that in combination with others to get many of these implementing governments to step forward on the financial front. So policy front, financial front, that's I think where we can have the most influence. Thank you. Niels. Um, you raised uh, an interesting point that I'd like to reflect on in terms of the broad theme of global health diplomacy, which was specific to the Uganda uh, situation with uh, some of the punitive uh, laws that are being debated in their parliament right now about, uh, about uh, gay sex. Um, this is an area where uh, working at really three different levels uh, is terribly important. First is at the programmatic level. And clearly with the programs uh, in the field uh, that are supported by USAID and CDC and others through PEPFAR, uh, having the programmatic backbone to actually deliver effective services and, and to withstand those kinds of political pressures is mm -hmm. key. Secondly, is in the area of bilateral and, as you correctly pointed out, trilateral uh, uh, discussions, both the U.S. government on the diplomatic side and <coughs> the U.S. government working with other major partners um, who have relationships themselves with the Ugandan government are having I think substantial influence in uh, keeping this from moving forward. We do not expect this to move forward into becoming actual law. And then thirdly, we have to look at this from the standpoint of global norms and trying to create a new environment in which these kinds of laws simply cannot uh, pass and survive. So starting about a year and a half ago in my role with WHO, we started uh, slowly building the case uh, for uh, LGBT access to healthcare services. Uh, this is under the broader umbrella of universal health coverage. Um, we, we believe that if it says universal, it actually means everybody, not just everybody that we like or they like. Uh, and so uh, we've, uh, we had a uh, special event at last year's World Health Assembly that Secretary Sebelius spoke at on LGBT health. Uh, had a very wide and interested audience, but we let that simmer for a year as uh, this, these discussions take time in, in Geneva and in the multilateral environment. Uh, coming up uh, this May, immediately after the World Health Assembly at the next executive board meeting, uh, it's our intention to introduce, together with partners from Brazil, South Africa, Thailand, Norway, Australia, and others, um, a resolution on LGBT access to health care. Uh, and uh, this, we're running into headwinds. We expected this from uh, the usual suspects. Uh, but uh, this, there's been a lot of uh, groundwork done, and uh, we believe that we'll be able to prevail to bring this to final uh, closure with the 2014 World Health Assembly with a, a, a resolution on, on LGBT access to health care. So um, that's, that's the long arc. Uh, that we have to look at when we're looking at how to use the tools of global health diplomacy. Mm. I wanted to just wait one other issue which has come up a lot. We just had a recent trip to South Africa. Uh, again, we write papers around that. That's, that's what we do here. Uh, and one of the issues that was really staring us right in the face very early on was gender violence. Um, HIV there is so strongly connected to the atrocious rates of violence against women and PNG, another place where the rates are absolutely a astonishing. You have a better chance of being raped than you do of graduating from high school. Uh, the, I think that we have to figure out how it is that we play a constructive role in those discussions. Obviously those are deep domestic 
uh, issues that are cultural, they're, they're religious, they're, they're not necessarily around laws. But at the same time, if we're going to really be effective in fighting HIV in South Africa, what we heard right from the start and all the way through our five-day trip was if you, if you don't fight gender violence in South Africa, you will never make headway. So we're investing a lot of money, uh, $500 million a year or something like that, fighting an epidemic where one of the main causes is kind of still not being addressed as directly as we want. So uh, I know that there's a lot of commitment from the U.S. government to do it, so this is not a, a push, but I think it just raises the real uh, biting challenges that we have to confront. TB in Eastern Europe, uh, most of those countries are ignoring TB, and particularly MDR-TB, particularly among migrants and prisoners and the folks that, that are often most affected by the disease. So you know, one of our multilateral challenges is how it is that we together work to, to come out with a new approach to addressing some of those populations, because none of those three diseases we're going to be able to do well if we don't figure out how to deal with some of these tough issues. So we've talked here a bit about creating the right funding <coughs> environment for uh, carrying out uh, some of the work that is envisioned in the strategies for, for many of the different multilateral organizations. We've talked a bit about creating the right enabling or policy environment. And what I want to turn to now and to pose to, to Niels and Leslie is, you know, to ask you to talk a bit about U.S. diplomatic, you know, partnerships or, or collaborations um, with, with other countries and, you know, perhaps not with governments, but with uh, the non-governmental communities, the advocacy groups, and, and the corporate sector. What are the, um, what are the relationships that are most important in, in reaching out on funding and in reaching out on some of these policy questions? I know we've already talked a bit about the resolution that, or the, uh, the plan that, that Niels mentioned for the next executive board. What are the, you know, what is, is it the, the kind of traditional partners, the donor community that, that the U.S. will reach out to, to, uh, to create messages, to, to create support for funding and policy? What is the role of the, the middle-income countries, which many of which, the BRICS in particular, are becoming very active in policy debates anyway around uh, global health? How does the U.S. reach out to them? What are the messages that, that work in terms of trying to create those kinds of collaborations? And then finally, what is the the relationship with the corporate sector and with uh, the, the non-governmental groups that are very active, certainly with the Global Fund, and certainly have uh, quite a bit to, to say and, and to contribute around the other debates as well. So. Let me start uh, with the last part of the, your question. Um, rather than do a, a long response, I'll start with that and then throw it to Leslie for, for more. Um, you mentioned what's, how are we starting to work with the BRICS? Well, in fact, um, as was mentioned, uh, my office has a set of health attaches. Uh, uh, Leslie came and, and met and spoke with them a few weeks ago when they were all in town for a meeting. And uh, we've identified a set of key countries where uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has a lot of ongoing activities through NIH, CDC, FDA, um, and others. Uh, and in those countries, we've assigned health attaches who are employees of my office, but who work for the U.S. ambassador there. Uh, and uh, interestingly, you mentioned BRICS. Uh, the countries where we have attaches right now are Brazil. Uh, we're talking about getting one in Russia, um, India, uh, China, and South Africa. Uh, strange coincidence. Uh, and, and we, of course, have an, an attache in Geneva, which is not a country, but uh, thinks it is. Uh, so, so the the uh, the the, um, uh, the importance of an ongoing, in-depth dialogue, in which uh, we have technical expertise on hand, working deeply uh, together with the diplomatic side, um, helps us to identify issues in which we can work together in the multilateral arena, as well as identify common priorities uh, in the the bilateral arena, and, and we see this as a very important wave uh, of the future. Okay. <clears throat> um, I mentioned country ownership as being one of our major goals. And uh, by that, we don't define it as simply country ownership by the government. Um, we've, we really feel that country ownership is throughout civil society, um, community groups, women's groups, uh, and local and uh, non-governmental organizations. I mean, we have relied in the, in the uh, uh, national government uh, for decades on our non-governmental uh, organizations to implement our very effective health programs. Um, and that will definitely be a thrust 
Um, and it's definitely a thrust of missions abroad, embassies abroad, that we go out into the communities. Because we feel that if, if at the local level, the community level, people really take ownership and become advocates for their own global health, uh, that will uh, necessitate their putting pressure on their local officials and eventually national officials to provide the kind of health care that they really want. So we, are, we define uh, country ownership pretty broadly. That said, since we do deal a lot with governments, and we talked about trilateral um, agreements, um, one, one of the privileges I had while I was in Mozambique is that we signed, my Brazilian uh, uh, counterpart and I, along with the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, a trilateral agreement to work uh, together with the Mozambicans, Brazilians, Americans on uh, health issues and also on food security. And uh, that was just about a year ago. Uh, the push to get it done at the end, but, uh, but we did manage to do it. And I think it's a, a good example of um, emerging sure. economies. Um, I served in Brazil at the very beginning of my career. Uh, when Brazil was a recipient more than a uh, donor partner. And it's, it's really gratifying to see this evolution, uh, the way Brazil has taken responsibility for its global health, and now is in a position to reach out to the Lusophone um, uh, communities in, in Africa and uh, expanding, I think, to other communities as well. So we will uh, hopefully sign more of these kinds of trilateral agreements. And we, we need to look beyond the uh, traditional uh, partners. Uh, the BRICS emergency, uh, emerging economies are, are areas and uh, countries that we'll be looking at. Can I come back to the first part of your question? Yes, Here. please. All right. Uh, you, you mentioned how do we work with governments and NGOs and the private sector. And uh, it's, you know, our, our focus is about improving health. Uh, it's not about getting along. I mean, we like to get along, but the point is uh, to, to improve health. And um, so it's really, it depends on the, the particular set of issues involved. Um, part of this means that we have to maintain open and collegial relationships, but also honest and frank relationships so that people understand there are things that we're going to differ on, whether it's with another country or with uh, a different sector. Um, we will try to be as clear as we can about what our aim is in doing this. But uh, for instance, uh, uh, we, we have been increasingly engaged in internal discussions within the U.S. government uh, on trade issues uh, because increasingly in uh, today's world, uh, trade has huge implications on health. And whether that is trade in tobacco products uh, or issues of uh, pharmaceuticals and intellectual property protection, uh, we believe that the health perspective needs to be strongly represented within the United mm -hmm. States government as part of that dialogue. We, we don't make the final decisions as to what USTR does. Uh, that's from, for the White House to decide. But we want to make sure, and I think it's really for the very first time, that this uh, perspective has been strongly introduced, and our secretary is uh, uh, deeply committed to this. I'm laughing because when I worked for the Clinton administration, we tried to have meetings with the U.S. trade representative, and they really didn't want to talk to us too much. Um, so one day we got a panicky phone call that ACT UP was scaling the walls of the trade building, you know, next to old executive office building. They were throwing ladders up the side, and they were coming over the ballots. What should we do? And we said, well, I don't know. We're going out for lunch. Call us and let us know how it went. <laughs> uh, so it was kind of our nice way of saying it would have been nice if you talked to us before. Uh, maybe now there's some uh, anxious. I mean, I think it's a perfect example of where we need to figure out how to work together with an industry that sometimes we don't agree with, but where the interest, it doesn't make sense for the USTR to be negotiating a bilateral trade agreement where we're forced to buy drugs at a high price and then put Gavi and Global Fund in the position of having to pay uh, higher prices that they can't afford. So it, it's a real challenge for us. The bad drugs issue that you mentioned is a good one. The IOM just put out a report around uh, uh, counterfeit and, and fake medicines, although I think they are very clear they don't like the word counterfeit, but the bad drugs is maybe the best way to say it. On the 29th of April, uh, here at CSES, we're going to be doing something in the afternoon on that issue. Uh, we're working with the IOM and the FDA, uh, and it really is one of those very critical issues where you have to figure out how to come together across sectors and, and with many of these governments. China 
is the producer of many of the world's best uh, generic drugs. They're, they are the producers of most of the artemisinin that goes into the antimalarials. They are also the production factory for many of the bad drugs. And so it's an issue that they're struck with, and it's an issue that we need to work with them on. <coughs> India, the same thing. So it maybe is a good example of one of these things where we need to come together uh, and build new relationships to try to figure out how together we fight uh, the proliferation of bad drugs that are out there. <clears throat> Just um, also addressing the issue of private enterprise. Um, <clears throat> this is an area that I've thought a, a lot about over the last few years. We've had tremendous support from governments around the world in global health. Um, but there, I think we can do more with private enterprise. And um, it's interesting to think about the fact that the bulk of our uh, assistance, U.S. government assistance, which, by the way, is now 25%, global health represents 25% of our overall uh, assistance around the world. Uh, the bulk of that is in sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> and I think you've read and, and noted that uh, there is a lot of interest in sub-Saharan Africa as one of the few areas of the world that is actually growing. We had about 7% growth rates uh, in Mozambique uh, the last year that I was there. There's tremendous interest uh, among American companies to get engaged in Africa. They're learning about uh, uh, Africa, more traditional markets or in other parts of the area uh, of the world. And um, this is a, there, there are possibilities of mutual interest mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. as, um, as they get more engaged in uh, developing energy resources, um, looking at uh, their ability to support uh, the public uh, sector, public uh, interests of the countries that they're working in, particularly global health. Um, there are great opportunities there. Uh, about a year ago, we did a, uh, a large conference, worked with USTR and other uh, in commerce um, in, uh, in Mozambique. We had about 100 different American and international companies that attended it. The president uh, of Mozambique uh, gave the plenary address. I gave an address, and frankly, my message to those companies was, you can do well in Mozambique, but you can also do good. So don't forget your social responsibility as you come and develop uh, and assist in, in Mozambique's uh, economic and, uh, and social uh, responsibilities. You have a social responsibility. So we're reaching out, uh, plan to reach out more to private enterprise and get them more engaged and look at symbiotic ways to uh, support global health. Let, let me key on that as well. Um, Doing domestic health care at the Department of Health and Human Services, we recognize that about three quarters of uh, the U.S. health care expenditures are uh, dealing with the consequences of chronic non-communicable disease. We also recognize that around the world today, uh, close to two-thirds of all deaths that occur worldwide now are due to NCDs. Uh, mm -hmm. and that four-fifths of those deaths are occurring in low- and middle-income countries. So this is no longer what I used to characterize as a disease of affluence. In fact, we're seeing it in uh, low-income uh, urban slums uh, throughout the world. When we look at the drivers of this, the key diseases being uh, heart disease, stroke, diabetes, mellitus, um, these are driven by, uh, often by diet. I'll leave the tobacco aside, this, uh, that, that's sort of a category to itself. But uh, everybody has to eat. Uh, we used to be hunter-gatherers, and we liked our food salty, fatty, and sweet. Um, and that is sort of how we're programmed. The food industry uh, and beverage industry has responded to that by meeting market demand. Uh, and uh, are now driving, uh, because of uh, processed foods, are, are driving the global obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, uh, stroke pandemics. What do we need to do to change that? We need to engage with the food industry. Um, we're not going to do away with it, um, and we wouldn't want to, but we can certainly help to influence the directions of sodium levels, of trans fats, of uh, uh, sugar levels in, in sweetened beverages and, and other foods. And one of the things that we've heard is that uh, the responsible parts of that industry, and there are a lot of them, uh, would love to have a meaningful dialogue that's not just with the United States, but an international dialogue with, uh, with uh, leading economies 
uh, to set a set of standards because then they don't have to be in an arms race to up the amount of uh, sugar in their, their drinks to get greater market share. If everybody agrees we're going to keep it to this level, uh, then you can start to bring the global burdens down. And this is a part of the, the multi-sectoral approach uh, to both global health and the diplomatic side because we need to enlist other governments in this as well. Well, we've, we've talked a bit about 2013 and already gotten a bit into what happens beyond 2013, but I just want to end with this portion of the discussion before we open for audience uh, commentary and, and questions as well, just to ask the three panelists to, to say a bit about what's on the horizon, kind of beyond uh, these replenishments and, and the high-level panel and some of these, these other uh, activities and, and moments that, that we've been discussing. And from a health diplomacy standpoint, how does what happens this year in terms of the replenishments, uh, in terms of the outcome of the, the post-MDG discussions and others, how does what happens this year and, and how, how the U.S. interacts diplomatically with these processes, um, how does that uh, influence what the U.S. should do to prepare for what's around the corner? So I'll start with Neil. Um, boy, that's a broad question. Uh, let, me, let me take one, <coughs> one, um, one element of that. Um, the world, as we're keenly aware, is in the midst of a profound um, economic and health transition. Uh, globalization, the dramatic changes that have occurred in terms of uh, the shift from uh, low income to, to low and middle, low middle and middle middle income uh, economies, China, India, uh, and increasingly now in, in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. We're seeing a huge shift, and whereas uh, when I started my career in global health uh, a number of years ago, uh, it was really a bimodal world. There was the poor in developing countries, and then there was the rich. And the focus of uh, global health was really on poverty health. Now what we're seeing is that it's much more of a spectrum. And one of the things that uh, we, the United States government, uh, need to do and are in the process of thinking through is a, a more nuanced analysis of this transition from um, countries and societies that simply need help uh, to, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, countries and society, societies where uh, an active technical and professional engagement is uh, deeply beneficial to both sides. Uh, and uh, the, the spread among them. And instead of saying you get to here and then you're no longer an aid recipient, you drop off and we don't have anything to do with you anymore, um, now we're really looking at ways of engaging across that spectrum at reasonable levels, at much lower cost when you get out to the, uh, the further advanced societies, but not simply dropping off the, the screen. So I, I think that's one of the things that, that you can be looking <coughs> for over the second Obama term. Uh, as uh, we sort of look in a more sophisticated and deeper way at global health. Um, I agree with everything you said, Niels. Um, <clears throat> I think we're all um, aware of, concerned about the fiscal difficulties that uh, not only in this country and, and among our partners uh, that we're facing in the future, we have to be cognizant of that. Uh, and sensitive to um, everyone's uh, concerns in their own countries. Um, and I, I think it will uh, mean that we will have to look for even better coordination among um, our partners, uh, bilaterally and multilaterally, uh, whether it's on, on the international level or it's in, uh, in countries uh, with global health teams that are working there. Um, and also just to make sure that the, the countries in which we're working, um, that they're aware of all the resources that are available. Uh, new f new uh, uh, funding model in, uh, in the Global Fund, and that will take some education to make sure that um, uh, countries are aware of um, how they can access uh, funding to support their needs. So I would say better coordination among uh, all of our partners and making sure that all the resources are well known. So I'd, I, I guess I'd end with uh, this part with talking about accountability. Um, I think that we have a lot to do to help citizens hold their governments responsible for doing a better job in addressing their health needs, both in the positive way for bringing vaccines that can help protect children, 
uh, bed nets that can help ch children and moms, HIV treatment, those things which ought to be available and are available and often are, are missing only for lack of government engagement. Um, so I think we need to help citizens find ways to be holding their governments more accountable. I think we need to figure out how to hold the donors more accountable uh, for fulfilling the promises that they have and putting forward the money that we need to do this work. Uh, we are talking about a constrained fiscal environment, but what we're talking about in terms of scale of money is small in comparison to many of the other things that are out there. So yes, we need billions, but you know, in global currency, billions is, is, uh, is millions and thousands. So I think we can, we can do a better job there. And lastly, I think we have to figure out uh, how to hold some of these multilateral organizations that play an absolutely critical role more accountable for what they do or they don't do. Um, we go into some detail in that uh, in the papers, but many of these institutions like Global Fund and like Gavi depend on um, a network of partners being effective with countries, bringing civil society to the table, bringing technical expertise to the table. Uh, and when it works, it's a beautiful thing and you can see uh, dramatic and real health improvement. But when it doesn't work, oftentimes you're stymied to figure out, well, why aren't people held accountable? Uh, when I see a global fund grant going out to fight an HIV epidemic in an injection drug using environment and 75% of the budgets for printing, I want to know who wrote that proposal. I want to know, what, did the UN AIDS person light himself on fire before this showed up in Geneva? I mean, how do we end up with, with such a massive waste of money? Uh, and I, it's not to find blame. It's to figure out how do we just get out of that system because in this tough environment, we have to be accountable for making the money work. And that's a place where it just simply doesn't. So I feel like the way to bring some of this stuff together is to increase the transparency, increase and improve the governance, and really hold all of our, our, our work, uh, each of us, to account for whether or not we're really making a difference in fighting the diseases. All right, well, we've, we've talked about accountability and coordination and collaboration and multi-sectoral engagement and now it's time to engage the audience in some commentary and, and questions as well i see a number of hands already up let me let me ask you to um as i identify you please wait for a microphone to come your way because we do want to be able to uh both record this and engage the online audience and let me just ask you to please state your name and affiliation make your intervention uh, brief, please, because we do have a lot, of, a lot of energy here in the room. I'll take a couple of questions and comments and then ask the panelists to respond and then we'll go forward again. So let's start over here, please. Hi, my name is Nicholas Berkfeld. I'm a medical student at Yale. And this question is uh, for Dr. Dallaire. In your recent health affairs article, you list a bunch of priorities that uh, the global health and uh, the federal government will focus on going forward, and in a lot of them, there's sort of a unifying theme that wasn't necessarily addressed that comes up not only with neglected tropical diseases, uh, food and, and water security, um, catastrophes, and then also influenza. There's a linking factor to all of those, and something I was thinking about yesterday, there was a New England Journal article talking about the effect of global warming on health. And what I'm curious about is if there's any thought process in, in this aspect of government about how would you coordinate those types of things um, and how would you go forward to try to think of this in more of a bigger perspective? Thank you. Uh, let's uh, turn over here in the back, please. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Hernan Rosenberg, previously with the Global Fund and uh, Pan American Health, uh, I thought. <laughs> uh, I think an important question in the issue of global health is the question of global health governance. And I think that uh, I would uh, uh, like to hear from the panel some views on that, particularly because you know most of the governance setups, like WHO and whatnot, are meant to be intergovernmental. So in other words, the main participants are sovereign states. We see that uh, that causes a problem in terms of the assignment of resources, because some of the problems are not to do with governments, but with the particular pockets of population, as been mentioned. But at the governance level, you have now the board of the Global Fund and other hybrids where the private sector participates. And governments may be corrupt, whatever you like, but at the end of the day, there is an election and somebody has something to say about what they vote for or not. How does that work in terms of the non-governmental animals that are part of the governance? That's one point. And uh, the other point is, uh, 
uh, interesting race uh, issue about the uh, food. If you let the, the, of course, the private companies are doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, if the market wants sugar, fat, and, and salt, well, let's sell that. So how do you see a mechanism to do some sort of a balancing act at the global level with this? Because some, otherwise, we end into the globalization of bad food, which we don't want either. Thank you. OK, let's see. Um, we'll take, we haven't been over here yet. So over here, please. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. My name is Manaus Harrison, and I just came back from a Fulbright at Georgia, Tbilisi. And um, my question goes back to lots of points that you basically made, but how do we do it is a question. Uh, you talked about accountability, and um, you talked about policy, effect of the policy. And I saw policy written, piles and piles and piles of them all around. And it's where we leave it and how do we take it to implementation? And perhaps goes back to the gen gentleman's questions into if there is a glo global uh, uh, approach to governance about health, then uh, how do we keep the, um, these states um, accountable into the money that's trailing constantly there, but the outcome is not really uh, in the health of the uh, population? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And let's take one more, and I want to not to make you run around <laughs> too much with the microphone. Uh, let's see. Actually, why don't we take those three and then I'll start. Um, I'll I'll start over here. So, so what I what I've heard is you know a question about the relationship of many of the the policy discussions to um, global warming. Uh, this question of governments or governance, pardon me, and the role of the um, non governmental sector within uh, some of the organizations like the Global Fund. Uh, how do you balance, you know, in this, you know, kind of discussion about, um, in particular, around food and, and health, how do you balance market demand and some of the regulatory measures um, under consideration? And then, you know, finally, this question of, of policy, it's one thing to write it and have it there, but how do you actually achieve the implementation? So uh, let me start with Todd. And so I'll jump to the questions around governance and maybe a little bit around how do we do it, but I think you can tell us maybe since you just came back, how do you actually do it in Georgia? Um, Global Fund's been a really interesting experiment right, uh, around governance. It's one of the few international boards that actually has rules that are designed to in promote inclusion. So for every decision of the board that's formal, uh, half uh, the board is split into two groups, the implementers and the donors, and you need a majority of both sides for something to pass. So you can't have kind of one group lording it over the other in terms of votes. Um, we have uh, three uh, non-governmental uh, positions on the implementing side. We have northern NGOs, we have southern NGOs, we have affected communities on the donor side, we have private foundations and the private sector. The rest seats are generally government. Um, Honestly, I think the biggest representational governance challenge at the Global Fund is the voice of implementing countries. Uh, the NGOs are really good at talking. Uh, sometimes it's like, shut up. Uh, 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 because they're so good at it and they understand deeply the policy issues and they're often sort of sitting next to ministers of health who kind of have plunked down at a Global Fund board meeting among a million other things. They've got quick talking points. They don't really understand the depth of the issues going on. Their, their uh, levels of detail uh, and acronyms that they don't follow. And it, you see conversations happening where three quarters of the room is completely unaware of what's actually being discussed. And it's very frustrating because those decisions often really make a difference. Uh, we've struggled a lot with this issue. Uh, Hare is here representing uh, Minister Tedros, who was the former board of the chair. It's very difficult to get implementing country governments to the table in an effective way. They don't organize themselves naturally to come to the Global Fund board meeting and speak on behalf of Southern Eastern Africa or you know, Asia or Latin America. So we're asking people to do very difficult things. That said, I think it's, it's been extremely helpful to have everybody at the table and painful and ugly as it sometimes is to work through the compromises that let us all feel like what comes through uh, has broad support. So the strategy, uh, the five-year strategy that I worked on, we spent a year on the road traveling around, meeting with different constituencies. 
And in the end, when we sat down at the ACRA board meeting to approve it, every single board constituency not only said yes, but they said yes enthusiastically. And they knew what was in it. Uh, when we got to the new funding model, very painful, very long discussions, but when we finally said yes to it, people understood what was in there and they, and they affirmatively supported it. So I, I think that there is something to be learned there, although it still is obviously a work in progress. Um, the translating all this policy into practice, so we have a new global fund strategy, we now have a new funding model, but, but it's really about a very different way of doing business with implementing countries. We'll see. Uh, I, I think honestly I go back to saying accountability and transparency uh, is probably a, a big antidote to this. The more people understand how much monies are going into their cu countries from donors, what's supposed to be accomplished with those monies, and, whether, and some indication of whether or not that's happening, allows citizens to hold their governments and the donors that are funding those governments more accountable. So I, I think that that's at least a bit of it, which is making a lot more of what we do open to the world to inspect and comment on and, and hopefully correct. Leslie. You know, I just want to make um, a comment about um, accountability and, and governance and also implementation um, as it's related in the field. Um, I will tell you that this is a chief concern of, of our ambassadors abroad and their teams. I mean, we're very much aware of the economic situation in the U.S. and we want to make sure that every dollar um, uh, that is spent uh, on our global health programs and all our assistance programs um, is, is going into the right kinds of programs and being managed effectively. And, and that's a real challenge. Um, we, in, in Mozambique, we had over $300 million a year, uh, of which the bulk was uh, global health funding. Um, and I was very cognizant um, of our responsibilities to make sure that this was being used effectively. It's a challenge, um, and it, it's, the, it's the role of the Chief of Mission uh, working with their teams to be monitoring and evaluating uh, consistently uh, as not only health officers go out in the field, but other officers to visit projects, to see how they're, they're going, and um, to, to really be giving, giving a, a once-over to see if this is effective uh, uh, expenditure of our, our funding. And if it's really, I think probably the most important thing, is it benefiting people on the ground, uh, which is a real challenge. So um, all I can tell you is that um, we take those responsibilities uh, seriously, and um, that will certainly be something as we move more and more into country ownership, which is a goal uh, for uh, countries to be doing all their planning and their implementation, their monitoring and evaluation, and eventually uh, managing all the expenditures in global health. This is something that we're going to be paying a lot of attention to in the, in the next few years. Nils. Um, let me just reflect on this for a moment from a personal standpoint. Um, what you see up here is the bureaucratic avatar of uh, somebody who spent 20 years in the field actually running uh, health programs. Uh, I, I try to wear my suit well, but it's not, uh, it's not who I feel I am. And my <coughs> fundamental mindset is always about the pragmatic, what can we do to change something that's important? Um, uh, I, I, I love a quote from W.C. Fields uh, with uh, all due respect to think tanks and Washington groups who said, uh, my doctor told me I had to give up half my sex life. I don't know which half to give up, thinking about it or talking about it. Uh, so so uh, we, we try to think of ourselves more as Mae West kinds of people. Uh, that's a, an old reference. But uh, uh, the, the, um, the idea then, and this goes This is going to come back to haunt you, Nils, right? We've gone from hamburgers to Mae West. Uh, the, the, uh, the, this goes back to a number of the questions here. So you asked the question about um, climate change. Uh, and what's not clear to us, we, we certainly see the connections between climate change and human health in a wide array of things. The question is, what can we from our operating uh, position do about it? And it's not clear to us what we can at this point. So we have not actively engaged. 20 years ago, we would have said the same about 
trade. Uh, and today we've got better levers to actually start to have an in impact on the trade discussion, so we are doing something about it. Uh, in the area of uh, the, the issues of uh, global food, how do you address food at a, at a global level, we recognize that, um, that food is a huge international industry that uh, whether we're with them or not with them, that the multinational food companies have huge influence in terms of what people put into their mouths. Um, and so engaging with them uh, as constructively as possible, providing uh, not only guidance, but where, where possible some, some leverage points uh, in terms of global norms uh, is a very important aspect of this. This is not to say that we turn everything over to uh, to global industry, but rather that we recognize that they play a very important point. Ultimately, when we go about doing things, we try to look at where this is going to really have an impact downstream and not in 30 years. Our, our time horizon isn't that good, um, but in the next three to five years or, or sooner if possible. And I, I think that's where, uh, that's sort of where our sweet spot is, is, uh, is trying to influence middle-term policy. So one, one plug while we're here, since I have two U.S. government officials, I mean, I think that one of the challenges with accountability is actually access to information. So, you, you know, it, it's, we've seen a tremendous improvement, and thanks to the Internet, you can now download the, the COPS, or, you know, for PEPFAR. You can see some of the things, but we don't see the grant agreements, and we don't see the budgets. We don't see the stuff that really allows us and many of the people working in these countries to understand what exactly is going on, who's getting money to come help our citizens, how much are they getting, what kind of overheads are they charging. I think we, we have a little bit of work to do ourselves to figure out that line, and I know there's a line there around how do we maximize transparency and accountability on our side, uh, because I think that there is still a lot of suspicion out there that our money is not being used uh, to full advantage. Uh, so I, we can help lead the way in terms of accountability. Thank you. I know I said I would turn over here, so let me turn all the way. Um, where's our microphone? Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Let's um, take here and here to start, and then I know we've got a few over here as well. Hi. I'm Ann Pence, and I'm currently with Covington & Burling, which is a law firm, but I'm not a lawyer. I'm a development economist, so I spent most of my life at State and AID and the MCC. And um, building on the MCC experience, mm -hmm. which I started four years before the organization was created because I was part of the team that looked at how to set it up, I want to ask the group um, about the upcoming discussion of the post-2015 Sustainable Development Goals and that process, and to say that when we first did those Millennium Development Goals, that started in 1991, by the way, there wasn't any focus on country ownership or accountability. And, you know, I think the U.S. has led the way, not always easily, using the MCC model to make information on grant agreements and their programs and their budgets available to local people. And I'd like to know if there's appetite in the international community to build in some of these accountability structures mm -hmm. into a robust and ambitious set of, you know, next era sustainable development mm -hmm. goals. And how those of us here, if that is a goal of yours, could support you and build momentum mm -hmm. for that, not just in donor countries, but in the countries that receive um, partnership resources, technical or otherwise, so that we can move forward in a way that gets results for people who don't have voice very often in these processes. Thank you. Then we'll go uh, one row back, just over here. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Laurent Hubert, and I work mostly on the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control and supporting its development and implementation. And my questions were in, in regards to the MDG review process. Uh, I was wondering about the, the U.S. position, especially towards they understand these two overarching health goals, uh, one of uh, addressing extended healthy life expectancy and the other one universal health coverage. So I was wondering what the U.S. positions, if there is a position already vis-a-vis -vis those, and, uh, and also if the U.S. would support an NCD-related target, uh, not a goal, but maybe a target in the MDG review process. Uh, in the area of trade, I found that quite interesting, and I was wondering whether um, what, ex what would be in your mind the best outcome, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the, the uh, TPP and other also uh, trade agreements? And the last question is related to the FCTC ratification. I understand the U.S. 
uh, there were uh, F the FCTC was a, a mongrel set of, pa uh, of other treaties that were potentially going to be submitted to the Senate last year. Uh, that did not happen, and whether you see that as a possibility on, with this next uh, three, four years of uh, this administration. Okay, thank you. I uh, will go over here, Janet. Thank you very much, and thank you for these very interesting presentations. My name's Janet Fleischman, and I work on women's global health here at the Global Health Policy Center. And I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about the importance of that principle of GHI, the Women, Girls, and Gender Equality Principle, to the work of this new Office of Global Health Diplomacy. We were honored to have Secretary Sibelius here in March speaking um, about these issues and, and her looking forward about the new administration and the priority given to these issues. But it would be great to hear from you, Ambassador Rowe, about how you see this as uh, a way that the U.S. can help catalyze approaches to integrating these issues in the countries you are working in. And then let's take one more. Where am I missing? Okay, let's, uh, let's just go back, back here. I don't want to... Um, I'm Susan Newcomer. I'm in the population dynamics branch of the NIH. I remember Nils negotiating, part of the negotiating team at ICPD in 1994. Uh, so I go way back with issues around population and family planning. I'd like to hear your comments on the Gates Foundation Family Planning 2020 program and how the U.S. government is or is not working with that group. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's hold and we'll give the panel a chance to uh, to respond and consider your questions and we'll do another round in, in just a minute. But I, I've got here uh, that have been posed uh, in terms of the post-2015 uh, uh, sustainable development goals. What's the place of accountability? And, and I think uh, the question was, you know, is there going to be appetite for discussing uh, integrating, better integrating accountability and how can the U.S. Uh, perhaps support that discussion? You know, a second uh, set of questions was around uh, the U.S. positions uh, regarding the potential for a NCD-related target uh, in some of the upcoming U.N. discussions, and then also the potential for ratification of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Where does that stand? A uh, third question around the um, place of the original GHI uh, core principle around uh, supporting the health of women and girls. Where does that fit in to the plans of the new Office of Global Health Diplomacy? And then finally, a question about uh, U.S. policies related to family planning and to what extent is that uh, corresponding with or related to uh, some larger plans afoot uh, through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others around uh, 2020. So please, I'll start with Nils. Um, a broad range of things. I'll, I'll <coughs> touch on them. I, kn I know our time is short here. Uh, certainly, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the post-2015 uh, MDGs, yes, there is very real appetite for, for transparency and, and accountability built into these. And uh, obviously, this is a work in progress. Um, but it's certainly something that we're, uh, we're encouraging. Uh, on the uh, issues uh, that you raised concerning uh, the FCTC and NCDs. Uh, first of all, with respect to the MDGs, we're, we're looking, you know, the challenge here is we're trying not to come up with 15 uh, health MDGs, but in terms of uh, a, a one of the targets, we would very much like to see uh, NCDs, which are now a global problem um, and not just a problem, as I said earlier, of the rich, uh, in, encompassed in that. Um, you asked some, some uh, challenging questions about uh, uh, U.S. trade negotiations, which I really am not at liberty to discuss, but just know that uh, what I talked about earlier is very important to us and we're pursuing uh, very hard in, in the process that takes place within the government. And as far as the FCTC uh, ratification, um, this was very close to going up to the Senate um, last year. Uh, ultimately, uh, based on uh, the, the perception that uh, there was one treaty that was ready to go, that uh, there was strong feeling that it would actually get Senate ratification, which was the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, and uh, if you followed that, that wound up not passing. Um, and uh, so th that was a pragmatic decision not to send it up because they wanted to get one, one thing through. It's still very much 
on the docket, but it's going to depend very much on the dynamics uh, in the Senate. And then um, last, on the question of um, uh, the Gates Foundation's uh, 2020 uh, push on reproductive health and family planning, I, I think this is a terrific and extraordinarily important contribution, uh, one which certainly fits well with the Department of Health and Human Services' domestic commitment to assuring that all women have access to family planning and reproductive health services. Uh, as far as the international side, uh, I can't speak for uh, my good friends and partner agency at uh, USAID. I know that they have a very active uh, family planning program. I used to be at USAID, but I'm not anymore. Uh, but I, I certainly uh, have the sense that there is a strong engagement there. Um, I'll focus on, on the last question on the issue of uh, integration of, of women and girls issues. Um, this is one of the GHI principles with which we, along with our other interagency partners, are committed to uh, implement. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we uh, plan to spend a lot of time. We're working already with our partners at state uh, in the GWE office as well as in USAID and our other, uh, other partners to look at how we integrate uh, women and girls issues into everything that we do. Uh, so I'll speak on behalf of USAID. They're firmly committed to that. Uh, <laughs> um, just a couple notes. One, Millennium Challenges, there's actually a lot of interesting uh, lessons to be learned, and I, I don't think we've plumbed those depths enough. So I don't want to leave that completely off the table, but I think there's a lot around the, the, uh, the compacts that they signed, which really articulated in a much more clear way what each is going to do in that relationship. Uh, there's been some work around women and girls issues, the legal frameworks, I think there's some very interesting stuff there. Around the MDGs, I think this whole universal access to health idea to me is a mistake. So I'll just put that on the table because it's a means to an end. It's not an end in of itself. And I'm afraid if there's something that we can't measure, we won't do it. So it sounds great and it sounds laudable, but until we can actually find out something we can measure. So maybe underneath that, there are these targets. But uh, you know, I, I do worry about us having something that sounds lofty, but ultimately doesn't allow us to hold ourselves accountable for whether or not we succeed. Um, and uh, around the family planning and reproductive health work, I actually think this is a really great issue where we need to figure out how to talk to Europe because they can't understand our conversations over here. And yet a lot of these policies are set in international environments. And you talk to anyone who's on the other side of the Atlantic uh, or the Pacific, frankly, and they just don't kind of understand this whole American reluctance to talk about reproductive health or, or sexual health and rights uh, or any of the other agendas which are, are, are quite common over there. So. Uh, this is a place where our politic makes any kind of intelligent conversation quite difficult, but we got to get through that. And I'm afraid if we don't figure that out really quickly, we're going we're gonna to lose the momentum that I think the Gates Foundation and Melinda in particular have helped to, to catalyze. Well, I think we could probably spend another 45 minutes to an hour with each of these questions, and, and I know that there are many questions that we won't be able to, to get to this morning. I want to thank all of you for coming to spend part of your day here and for having come to engage in conversation on the outlook for global health diplomacy in 2013 and the U.S. approach to diplomacy in the face of multilateral replenishments, uh, discussions, and engagement. Um, please join me in thanking our expert panelists this morning. And uh, let me just remind you, I think there were some uh, little bookmarks that, that you received on, on your way in, uh, which gives you some information about where you can access the volume of papers on a wide range of policy issues around global health in the second Obama administration term. Thank you very much.